We'll, we'll just give it a couple more minutes before you integration Monday. Um, this week we're joined by Andy Leonard, who's I think you're out out on the east coast of the United States, Andy, if I remember. Um, yes, sir. Andy, Andy's um, one of the sort of experts in data integration, so we invited Andy to come and talk to us about SSIS, and Andy's also going to talk about a little bit about the life cycle management for data integration. Now, we haven't really had a topic in this space. Um, I don't think we've had one yet on Integration Monday, but I think, to me, one of the um, one of the important things for Integration Monday is to make sure we're all getting exposure to a wide range of different integration scenarios. So, in, you know, in today's world, things like SSIS still have a very important place for data level integration. It's not all about biz talk. It's not all about APIs and logic apps and to get that breadth of integration, I think, is one of the one of the key things we need to be doing on Integration Monday. So, Andy's um, going to be the first in a few sessions we've got over coming weeks, um, where next week we're going to talk a little bit about Data Factory. Um, so, just to cover off a few other introductory things. So, if, if this is your first time on Integration Monday, thanks for joining us and. Hopefully, um, I've, I've been out kind of spreading the word about Integration Monday at a few user groups recently, so hopefully we've got a couple of people who've sort of found us via that route. But uh, you know, Integration Monday is all about giving the opportunity for a bunch of us to get together on a Monday evening to um, get people from the community, from the MVP group or from product teams to uh, come and talk to us about different, different aspects of Azure, about integration, and um, various topics like that. So, with that in mind, um, just if you want, you know, if we want to engage with each other around some of the topics we're talking about on Integration Monday, the first thing is that on the website we've got a discussion forum area where people can pop questions and comments. In addition to that, there's also the Q and A panel on the um, on the session tonight. So, Andy, if any, basically, if anybody pops any questions in during the session. What we'll do is at the end, when you're finished, I'll just go through those questions with you and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about some of those. Um, if anybody has any comments or feedback, they can also use the hash integration Monday tag on Twitter to tell us you know, any, any questions or feedback via that route. Also, um, we're currently running a survey at the moment, so we've had quite a few people who've given us feedback um, recently. But uh, here's the link for the this, this survey where we'd you know, we're hoping people can take a couple of moments to fill that in, and we'll um, we'll share that link in a minute on the um, Q and A panel. Um, so, upcoming sessions the next two weeks, we've got um, registrations already open for those. If anybody would like to join, so next week we've got Martin Abbott, who's from Australia, who's going to be talking about Data Factory, and then we've got Glenn from Belgium the week after about um, talking about EDI. So, a couple of um, you know sort of range and topics over the next few weeks. But at this point, I'm now going to pass over to Andy, and Andy's going to um, sort of talk to us about data level integration. Well, thank you, Michael. I really appreciate the, um, the invitation and the, uh, the opportunity to speak to, um, to, speak to the, the group here. Uh, it's a big honor for me. Uh, as, as Michael mentioned, I am from, um, from the United States, the East Coast. If, um, if you're better at geography than me, uh, I am in the state of Virginia, which is just south of Washington, D.C., the capital of the U.S., and I live in a town, actually outside of a town, and the name of that town is Farmville. I'm not making that up. Uh, it's, a, it's a real town. <laughs> so, um, and I, I was a, a farmer for years. I had a, a bunch of chickens, and I would put on social media that I'm going out to feed the chickens or, or work in the garden. And I actually had people say to me, um, gosh, you play that game an awful lot. Um, uh, I, I've never played the game for them, but um, uh, I was doing it in real life. So with that bit of an introduction, um, I, I believe integration uh, across the board is, uh, is huge. And I, I think that um, that what's what I'm seeing in the marketplace is a lot of people are beginning to realize just how important data integration is. There's a there's a lot of talk about some of the really cool new shiny technologies out there, machine learning, big data, um, all of these types of solutions, and and those solutions are um, mind-boggling. 
and they truly are. But what I've, I've noticed recently is folks are starting to realize that they can't make those solutions work. They can't put predictive analytics models uh, together in machine learning. They, um, they can't do data mining unless they have loads and loads of data. And how do you get that data to, uh, to the machine? Well, you, you participate in, in some integration strategy. And so data integration, at least from a, um, from a data standpoint, just a purely data standpoint, is starting to, to get more attention. I, I refer to it uh, as plumbing. And um, it is, it's a lot like that. We spend, um, we spend our time sort of under the surface. We're not doing the, the reports that you see in some of the great reporting engines that are available today. Um, Power BI, Tableau, Click. Um, there's, a, there's a ton of them out there. But all of them rely on, um, on, on a lot of data. And what, they, what they're finding now is, uh, again, more and more attention is being placed on, on the data integration side itself. So how do you get that data from where it is to, to where you want it? That's a really good question. And there's some, some great engines out there to facilitate with this. Um, I work mostly in the Microsoft space. So I've been working with SSIS now for about 10 years. Um, it, I remember about 10 years ago I was working on a book project with uh, nine other people. Um, Darren Green and Alan Mitchell from the UK, um, a team in the US, Brian Knight uh, led that team. And if you've ever seen that um, professional SQL Server Integration Services 2005 book, uh, that was back when Rocks would put the pictures of the authors on the cover and there's, there's 10 of us on there. I'm the, uh, I'm the old guy down front. So I've, been, I've worked on uh, several other projects related to um, to SSIS, several book projects, and I'm a practitioner uh, of, uh, of data integration with SSIS. So I'm, I'm not just a, a theorist. Um, and, and so one, one of the things that I've noticed about the experience that you have with SSIS, um, if you're working in, um, in the, the modern, more modern versions, I would say 2012, 2014, is you're going to see um, this integration services node, I hope you're able to see my screen and I'm trying to, to zoom and uh, account for any lag before it happens. I'm going to resume so that I can expand this node. I'm, I'm looking at Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio in 2014 and there's this integration services catalog node. And one of the things that you're going to notice right away when you start working with any integration services product is you're going to need some framework, some way to execute and manage the, um, the SSIS packages or the integration packages, whether you're working with Informatica, uh, SSIS, Ab Initio, a data stage, um, all of those tools have mechanisms for executing the loads. Um, there's different triggers for the loads. You can do it on the schedule, you can do it based on an event, and all of them have different ways that they approach that. I am not uh, an expert in uh, any of the other technologies outside of, um, of integration services, but I will uh, I'll share that the, uh, the the lessons that I've learned in integration services lead me to believe that while you can do all of the same stuff in integration services that you can do in any of the other integration platforms, that integration services requires you to construct some of those and not all of them. But I've got, the, I've got the catalog open here. This is uh, the an SSMS, SQL Server Management Studio. This is the SSIS DB, which is the name of the catalog. You can't change that in 2012 or, or 2014. Or from what I've seen so far, I don't believe you can change it in 2016. And I have a test folder here where I have some projects. And I can just right click on one of these um, SSIS packages that I have in here. And I can just execute it here manually. And when I do, it's going to bring up an execute package window. And I'm trying to scroll slowly because I know how this is across these uh, these web sharing uh, things. But I can just click the OK button, and it'll prompt me and ask, do I want to see an overview 
of the uh, of the operation, and I can click uh, click yes or no. I'm actually going to click no here, and I'm going to go use a, a different report to start with. There is a um, an integration services dashboard report, and I'm going to zoom out for just a minute because this is a it's a pretty handy report that that we can see. Um, there's uh, of course there's the um, the dashboard piece that tells me in the last 24 hours how many have have failed, how many are running, how many have succeeded, and then any other states that a package may find itself in. Things like the um, the the intent to execute has started, or the package is pending. Um, those sorts of states would fall into others. And then if we look a little farther, we can see the um, a little tablex here that has uh, links to all executions, all validations, all operations, all connections. And then finally at the bottom, we can begin to see this, um, this, this summary of packages that have executed in the past 24 hours. There's only been this one that we just ran, and it's called pkg.dtsx. And what I'd like to do is I'm just going to drill in on the all executions, which looks similar. It still has the... Um, it has the same format that we're used to seeing. We're seeing the one succeeded. We do see a bunch that fell into the um, into the others category, and this was due to some testing that's been going on uh, on this virtual machine that I'm showing you now. Note also that the time range is the past week. Um, so I was doing some testing before Thanksgiving in the U.S., and I can look at an overview of this package that just succeeded, and I can see a lot of information. That would really help me if I'm participating in an enterprise that is practicing DevOps. And I'm a fan of DevOps. I, I like the idea of if a server fails, um, I'd like to, to get another server online just as quickly as possible. I'd like to know, uh, looking, at that, uh, looking at documentation about that server, exactly the state it was in uh, when, when the old server went offline. Um, I'd like to collect as much information as I can about the ETL processes, extract, transform, and load processes that may be loading the data warehouse. And what I find is the SSIS catalog helps me with this by um, by storing the data, all of that data, in a um, in a database, SSIS DB database, which goes along with the SSIS catalog. And here's some some good information about what it's picking up. There's, it's, it gives it an operation ID. There's a, a package name and environment, which I'll come back to in a bit. But essentially, it is a way to externalize um, parameters that will be used for execution at runtime. The status, of course, the succeeded, uh, how long it ran, when it started, when it ended, and who executed the package. And now you all know my middle name. Um, there's some parameters used over here. These parameters in all caps are uh, runtime parameters in the SSIS catalog, and then some good old-fashioned messaging, same same type of stuff that we see in integration all over. And you know, we can drill into a uh, just a piece of this. We can look at the messages that were generated out of at the package level itself, and we see uh, again quite a few messages, not not a whole lot, but some. And and really, that's the you know that's a nice overview. Um, how does this help me in a DevOps way? Well, if I parameterize an execution, and I, I can do that, I've got some uh, some parameters uh, tests that I can execute. Um, if I configure this this package, I've got a bunch of um, parameters here that I that I have to configure. I have some that uh, are required, and I, I've named them in this way. So if I zoom in here, you can actually see the names of some of these parameters. The um, a package required Boolean parameter and uh, a package in, in a, you know an INT32 parameter, and you'll notice that this um, this one parameter at the very top uh, that's a package int32 parameter, its value is set to some text that's underlined. In SSIS, again, this this is how I do externalization. This is an environment variable. It's named test var. And it lives in an environment which is a collection of, of environment variables and values. I can assign multiple uh, references. Um, 
I can assign, well, one reference goes to one environment, but I can assign multiple references in this project at this configuration uh, level. And we'll see if I click on the, uh, the references tab here, where I do have two environments configured. And I can pick which environment I want to run with at runtime. And where this gets interesting is uh, when I do try and execute this SSIS package, because there are required values there, I get a note telling me that you know you've got some required values, but you haven't set a an environment variable yet. So in order to make this run, you're going to have to pick an environment. Uh, the way you do this in SSIS is you just uh, check the environment box, and then it wants to make sure that these required parameters are set. It's given me indications here that some are not, and I can just override those variable values manually. Um, this is a sensitive one, so I can type in a, uh, some text here. Uh, I can also um, assign these uh, to a to a value if there's a value available in my environment. Now there's there's not there's not too much of, uh, available for me at this level, but I could assign these in my um, in my project configuration when I'm all set. My warning should go away. I get a ready, and if I click OK again, I get the uh, the same execute message I got before. Do you want to view the um, the overview? And again, what's nice about this is that um, as this package ran, we see that it, it ran and succeeded. This parameterization, these values that I pick, they then show up in my parameters use list here. Um, I, I just I take care to not make them all caps so that I can separate visually the difference between the uh, parameters that are built in execution parameters, uh, those in all caps, and then the parameters that I supplied a value for. Now what's pardon me, what's nice about this and again in a, in a DevOps environment is that I can export uh, these, I can print them and, and I can certainly view them inside of the uh, the reports in the catalog here. What's not so nice is that I, I don't have a good way to, to view these outside of, of SSMS. And what worries me a little bit about these particular tools is that in order to give someone access to this report where they could right click and, and go to a report, since the reports are hard coded into SQL Server Management Studio, I also have to give them access to a bunch of other stuff that I probably don't want them. Uh, and I, you know, in order for this to make uh, to make sense in a production environment uh, for people who aren't necessarily data integration professionals, um, I've got to give someone access to production. I've got to put a tool on their desk that's uh, built basically for administering the database. And I've, um, I've got to give them this elevated permissions, this SSIS admin role in uh, 2012 and in, um, and in 2014. There's also a few other uh, drawbacks to this. One of them is that I can, you know, while I can look at a, uh, at a list of uh, packages that, that belong to a, you know, a project here, I'm trying to find one with multiple, so there's some there. I can right click and execute a package, but I, I can't right click and execute a project. There just is no execute option in here. So creating collections of packages can, can sometimes be, um, it can be a challenge. And then managing the metadata, I talked a, a little bit ago about moving the, um, or having metadata in an environment that, uh, in fact, the environment that we used was this test environment. And if I double click this, we can see there's the, um, there's the environment itself. Here's the variables that, that we were just looking at. We have a, a boolean in there and a, and a variable, a var. But if I want to script this to move it to another system, after I've created it, if I click the script button, um, it'll, it'll open a new script window. But if we uh, go over here and look, we'll see it didn't generate any text in that window. So it, it does work, but it only works um, before I've clicked okay after configuring the environment the very first time. And so there's there's some stuff here that in my opinion isn't isn't complete. It's good, 
And the logging works really, really well in the SSIS catalog. The um, some of the story around the the DevOps, the parameterization management, and stuff like that um, leaves a little bit to be desired. The first, you know, the first complaint I had, of course, is that I have to go clicking and searching for this information. I can't just see it. Um, it's not in the tree. So one of the things that I did is I've just been I've been playing around with some tools is I, I wrote a, uh, a catalog browser and I'll, uh, I'll just connect to this real quick and show you the difference. Um, one of the things that this allows me to do is if I'm I'm looking in this this one we just executed uh, this this package here I can see package parameters uh, from the very top level so that's something that I cannot see inside of the uh, inside of here I can just see the packages themselves and it's not necessarily bad that I can't see them but they're there and they're part of my uh, my configuration for for some of these executions um, if I look in the uh, let's see let's go look at the one one of the ones we just ran so we ran the parameters list and and that's this test here there's there's in addition to the packages themselves and the package parameters um, by the way, you can tell I, I, I borrowed their um, their text decorations, underlining if it's mapped to a uh, environment variable. Uh, you can see right, you know, just in one location, you can see all the way down into uh, what's happening here. Uh, that this is this particular parameter is mapped, and then I included a couple of other um, things that are I think are important to this. Remember before, in order to see the um, the, the reference we had to open up uh, PKG and then uh, go to configure and then click on the references. Um, if we look at that here, there, there's the and there's the project references there. I'm sorry, I did that at the wrong level. Didn't I? No, I was looking at the wrong one. That's what. So there's the two references. Uh, parameters list test. Sorry. There's the two references we saw before: test environment to test environment. And here we see them uh, listed under the project references. So those were, those references were created, and I I think this is just a little more holistic view of what we're looking at. And again, the idea is to um, to be able to at least see what's here first, and, and then we can see the project parameters, which none of those are mapped or overridden at this point. Um, one thing that we can do in an execution is we can manually override um, these values and, and they will show up as bold. And if I do that, I'm going to do that in this par uh, parameters list. I'm just going to go in and configure um, one of these parameters to always be this way. And this is an int32. I'm going to set it to 42 because that's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. I'm just going to click OK there and, and refresh that. And as I um, drill back into this, I look at the parameters list. Um, I see that was a project parameter. So if I if I go look at it inside of uh, their configuration, inside of what Microsoft provides us, uh, bold text indicates that the, um, that it is a manual override. So what that means is I've got three options on what I can set variable values to. One of them is I can go with the design time default. Another is I can use that environment, that collection of variables, and I can switch environments at execution time just by saying, you know, pick uh, environment one or environment two. And I can also do this manual override. This is the third way. This is this means whenever you run, run it this way uh, with this value. And they use bold to indicate that as well. Again, I borrowed their uh, uh, their their text decorations so that that I'm managing this too. But what I found, um, although this viewer is helpful, it, it does show me a lot, and I can look at the environments and I can see even the the environment variables and the, and their values um, here without again having to double click something or open, open something else up. But one of the things that I noticed is okay, this is good for here, but what if I need to uh, to, to migrate this data. I, remember I showed you I can't script it, so it can be uh, it can be a challenge to do that. So I've got uh, an instance 
a couple of instances set up here to simulate a test and a, um, a UAT environment where I may be performing some testing. And, and this is, uh, again, is this a little tool I worked out using the .NET libraries that are come with SSIS. And this is catalog compare. What it allows me to do is see what's in one location that may not be in another. And when I just ran the compare, the, the text changed. I got uh, italics here to indicate that there are some differences in things in the stage folder. And, and if I you know, if I look around, I can see, yep, there are, certainly are some differences here um, between the, these environment values. But it's okay in this case because the, the differences here happen to be between the uh, connection strings. And, and this isn't abnormal. So this, by the way, is in beta, as you can see in the title bar. But um, in this version, I'm just highlighting the differences. I'm not doing a compare on the package by package level. Um, that's coming, but it isn't cut into this yet. But where I want to take this is I want to be able to set up a repository that says, when I'm in the test environment, the test data source is this instance of SQL Server or this instance of Oracle or this flat file. And, and then I, the same for the UAT. This is the, uh, the instance for that. And I wanted to be able to uh, support comparing between those environments and seeing that, you know, the data warehouse source system uh, for our medical source data is, is uh, VM SQL 14 backslash test 2014 in the test environment. But over in the, um, in the UAT environment, it, it's, this, it's this UAT server. And I want to, when it does the compare, I want it to actually substitute and check to see if those are the, uh, are the same. Now, there's some complexity that I'm introducing in, into this. But, and again, I haven't built this, this piece yet for this. But this is the kind of information that I believe uh, helps us with, with DevOps. And it's some stuff that, again, it's, it's possible in the Microsoft environment in their ecosystem, but it's not really uh, built out. You have to build it yourself, kind of like I did. And one of the things I did, and I'll just show this and show up <laughs> about this, is, is I built a way to generate all of the scripts that, um, that, that work for this. So I pick a folder, and in this case, I'm going uh, to browse to my uh, E drive and Andy folder, and I'll just pick the prod folder here and click OK. Um, and what it's doing is it's, it went out and overwrote a, uh, a bunch of scripts. And if I go look on my e drive, Andy Prod, uh, we should be able to see with the date timestamp. I'm on the East Coast US, so we're about five hours behind London. Um, it's, it's right at 8 o'clock there, uh, 7.59 your time. We generated these sets of scripts and an ISPAC file. An ISPAC file is a it is a, a way to deploy SSIS projects uh, to a, a server. And the first thing I would need out there before I did that is a, is a folder to land them in. So if I double click this and uh, change my connection, I can aim this at, at my prod instance. And if, uh, if the way the script is written, there's a lot of documentation at the, um, at the very top. And then it prints a lot of documentation. So that I can see this information. Uh, it tells me where the script is, you know, where did we generate it, um, what the instance we use to generate it from, uh, the catalog name, which is redundant at this point, but there is some support inside of the Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services Catalog to allow you to name catalogs. Maybe they'll do that, maybe they won't. The, the folder name, where who generated this, when it was generated, and it was generated from this beta version of a SSI's catalog compare. And then when I deployed it, I ran it against this prod 2014 instance at this date and time, and this is who did that. And then you'll note uh, some good information here. Uh, that stage folder already exists. And, and the reason for writing the scripts this way, they're written to be item potent and um, basically re-executable without 
without harming anything. If that stage folder did not exist, uh, it would create it and it would note that. Um, it, this is built, again, for the DevOps enterprise, uh, trying to manage data integration with SSIS. I would copy this text and I would paste it into my, my ticketing system after I'd executed it. And then I would close that ticket with this note in there. Um, th this creates an audit trail. And, and it also promotes uh, having production database people or release management folks uh, perform this, um, these types of, of operations. This is a release. So this script was just executed against a, a, a simulated production instance. And you know, someone could, in release management or configurations management in a DevOps enterprise, could execute this. They wouldn't need SSMS necessarily to generate the scripts. They would need it to execute it. Uh, I'll just tell you that one of the things I hope to do before I'm done is more than just generate the scripts. I want to be able to generate and execute all of the scripts. And um, that's again, hasn't happened yet. But with the right permissions, I, I want to obviate the need to expose folks to all of this functionality that you know, in, in security and databases and server objects and replication stuff, they really don't need access to, um, especially at their elevated levels of um, permissions and in production. I, I just want to try and close that gap because I want everyone to have the minimal amount of permissions that they need to do their job, um, but uh, you know, no more than that. So this is. Um, this is just some thoughts that, you know, that I've been tossing around about, uh, again, about DevOps in the, um, you know, in the enterprise using SSIS as your, um, as your integration engine. So, I, I mean, I, I think uh, again, I think the importance is is obvious. And uh, this is this isn't everything that that I've played with. I can, um, I, I've talked. Um, I've worked a lot with um, automation using business intelligence markup language, and and I see all of these design patterns and all of these pieces kind of fitting together to allow us to do data integration lifecycle management um, using SSIS as the engine. Again, it's um, it, it's more manual than than you're going to find in other engines. Um, I know. I know Informatica does a lot of this for you. I know Data Stage does. I'm not as familiar with Ab Initio, but I imagine all of the engines that you're paying for are um, are providing a lot of this functionality for you. Um, SSIS is free. I'm doing the quotey air signs. Um, in order to execute SSIS outside of the development environment, uh, SQL Server Data Tools, you do need a SQL Server license, but um, it's it's built for ETL. It's built for data integration, and there's a, a slew of uh, folks out there in the community that can help you with support and, and with design. Um, and again, I just I see all of these pieces kind of fitting together. Business intelligence markup language, um, the you know the the tools that tools like what I'm building here, uh, the browser and the catalog compare. Um, other tools like um, uh, you know that I'm, I'm trying to think of, of something off the top of my head. I, I guess other than business intelligence markup language and, and the stuff that I'm building, um, these are um, these are ways to achieve automation. But what we want to do is produce uh, recreatable enterprise level data integration and, and something that's supportable and auditable in SSIS. So. That's uh, that's that's one of the things that uh, that those are the things that I wanted to talk about. I was just looking at one of the questions, and I see uh, someone is saying they can't see anything. Uh oh. <laughs> that that was from earlier, Andy. That was um, Paul, but I think he's confirmed he's okay now. Okay, okay. Sorry about that, Paul. Um, I, I'd be happy to take any questions or chat with you some more about it, Michael. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, uh, I wouldn't mind picking your brain actually. Um. You know, while we've got you, Andy. I mean, do, do, what's your thoughts around things like, um, you know, c customers? So we, I guess a lot of the guys on the call probably come from a BizTalk background or an Azure background, and we've um, 
we often come across this idea of like, you know, when does a customer use BizTalk, when does a customer use SSIS, but it would be good to, to get um, kind of a, a view from the other side of the fence, so to speak, to see if you've come across that kind of scenario very often and, and what kind of things you've seen. I have, and I've done some integration behind BizTalk applications. Um, I've, I've seen a lot in the insurance industry where they're, um, they're, they're, you know, folks are using BizTalk, and there's some incredible automation out there that that you can achieve with uh, with BizTalk. And there's a lot of opportunity for overlap between the two technologies. Um, I'll say that SSIS was built specifically for uh, for moving data, and and it does that rather well. And using um, BizTalk as an orchestration engine, I know it can do much more than that. I also know SSIS can do much more than move data, but uh, it, it does move data rather well. It's built for that, and you can, you know, you can interface at, at that crossroads where the orchestration needs to now call uh, perhaps a, a data warehouse load or some process where uh, an awful lot of data needs to be integrated. SSIS is is just built to do that. Will it do it better than BizTalk? I think the answer is going to be it depends. Um, that's usually the answer, and it's going to de depend on things like the size and shape of the data. Um, how fast do you need to execute it? Uh, there's a there's a little bit of startup overhead with SSIS. It's um, in the 15 to 30 second range to actually fire up a package, usually and get it running. Um, and there's also an opportunity to do uh, to do some stuff that I'm just not sure. I'm sure you can do this. I just don't know how to do it in BizTalk. But you can do integration with the cloud. You were mentioning some of your folks uh, doing Azure. Um, because Microsoft has created what, what I feel is a brilliant, uh, ubiquitous uh, you know, experience for the user and the developer. I mean, all you do is change the connection string. Uh, certainly, you log in with credentials. And uh, you know, provide your credentials just like you're connecting to a local instance of SQL Server. You just change it to something that looks more like a URL, and now you're sourcing or uh, or, or loading an Azure database. So you can do an awful lot between the two. And I noticed uh, you have an upcoming talk on Azure Data Factory. Uh, it's also an orchestration engine that's that's built to do. Um, data moving and it does some data integration uh, from the cloud as well uh, so there's just there's a lot of tools out there even in the Microsoft's ecosphere uh, where you can accomplish the same thing I, I think the primary driver for which one is going to be best is going to really hinge on size and, and shape of data and, and things like how soon do you need it to you know to make that move because each of those tools this talk SSIS and ADF they're going to provide different profiles for that experience. So is there, is there anything coming up in SQL 2016 that you're particularly keeping an eye out for, Andy, in, in this SSIS space? I am really excited about the um, the Azure support. Uh, that They just released that for 2014. I want to say it was in October. And uh, there's, a, there's a pack out there that supports Azure. Uh, you can do things like, like integrate with Hadoop. Um, you can fire um, different types of jobs and languages like pig and um, it's very interesting to me to see those lines blurring between on-premises and in the cloud and I, I just see that I see that distinction going away probably in the next two to three years there there will always be enterprises that for regulatory reasons or, or just for good technical reasons, are going to need to have a server, uh, you know, in the basement or in a data center that they own and, and that they integrate data to and from. But um, but by and large, I think the majority of what's in you know in house today, I think the majority of that. And when I say majority, I'm guessing, but I'm going to say anywhere from 51 to 80 percent. That's going to move. Uh, I think a lot of that's going to move into the cloud. Um, again, certain industries, little or nothing will move. But I think if you look at the industries in total and think especially about those shops, uh, Michael, that have maybe one or two people doing the job of 
of eight or ten. Uh, I know that never happens in real life, right? It's uh, <laughs> all hyperbole. But it, no, it is true. I've I've done those types of jobs before. I've not done them well, um, but I've done it. I've worked with folks who who you know find themselves as being the jack of all trades, and, and there's a huge uh, you know productivity boost to those folks when you can make things very simple, uh, very similar, and and you can um, you know you can take the load off their plate and push it into you know, into the cloud data center or, or something like that. I, I just see that that's being huge. The, the 2016, um, the stuff that is inside of SSIS in particular is not, uh, I, I mean, it would be of interest to people who are used to using SSIS. Um, there's, um, there's some interesting support for managing errors and data flows that, uh, that they're working on. Right now in the current CTP, CTP3, yeah, you know, all the dots aren't quite connected, but um, my understanding is that that's going to change, and we're going to be able to uh, isolate uh, down to the column name that raised the error. I think that's that's coming before it releases, um, and it's you know that that shouldn't be that wouldn't be terribly exciting to someone who hasn't tried to tried to troubleshoot that. But uh, just a, an anecdote, Michael, I I loaded the. Um, Years ago, I, I wrote a loader for the SAP vendor dimension, and um, I want to say there was 170 columns. And if you got one wrong, um, <laughs> running that down was not trivial. Yeah, and yeah, much. Yeah. It's really, really nice to say it was this column that caused this latest error. Even if you're doing them one at a time, if it'll it'll just put you on top of the single column, and and that's been difficult. And uh, oddly enough. It was easier in the first version, and then they made some changes that supported more performance. But they uh, they kind of shut this, isolating the column that caused the error part down. They're they're, they're fixing that. Um, I'm trying to think of what else is out there. Just, but I just I guess that the, the biggest thing is just this whole idea of blurring that line between on premises and the cloud, and you know, and and, and making data integration uh, such a such a cleaner story. Um, you know, between those two, and, and what I see right now is, is a lot of shops are calling and saying, "I want to move, you know, I want to migrate my databases into the cloud." And then a few months later, they're calling and saying, "Oh wait, um, you know, I want to do my uh, my data integration with the cloud as well." And what they're seeing is it's just not that big of a change, at least if you're running in uh, in SSIS. I suspect the same is true. In, in BizTalk as well, if you're going from on-premises to the cloud, you just change the connection strings and everything mm. works. Yeah, yeah, pr pretty much. I mean, there's obviously just a little, some little um, twist on the security, but that, that's the great story that it's it's so similar, even though it's hybrid, isn't it? So we've got a we've got a couple of other questions coming in, Andy, from um, guys on the call. So we've got okay. um, Keith who um, wants to ask about um, your thoughts on source control. Integration for SSIS. It's a great question, and the the problem with source control in SSIS is SSIS is XML, and, and it's not SSIS's fault. Um, there's there's issues with uh, anything that writes its source in XML and, and using source control with that. Uh, to be fair, the uh, the SSIS team has actually made this pretty easy. Well, I'll, I'll say this. It's easier. Let me see if I can find a um, an SSIS package here real quick we can look at. If I just open it up in uh, in Notepad, uh, we can see that that there's the XML. Now, if you if you did this in earlier versions before 2012, you would see like that second line, the DTS executable. It would have all of those subsequent attributes on the same line. So if you were trying to compare. Um, you may get that there's something different on line two, but line two may have a dozen attributes on it. Um, mm -hmm. They fixed that in 2012 by, by making this a little cleaner. You can see an attribute per line, and that's that's a little bit better for for comparing, but it's still a binary compare um, in, in that you know in that sense. Um, you know, so so when you're doing when you're using source control. Um, the fact that you have to go to a binary compare uh, means that there's other things that 
you can't really get to work well. And one of those, well, a couple of those things are branching and merging. You can branch, and branching works well. Just if if there's anything huge that you're trying to do, um, like let's say you have a team of developers and two people open check out and open the same package or open their versions of the same package, they both make changes and they go to check in. The first one wins. And the second one comes in, and there's that merge window that that may pop up depending on the uh, source control engine you're using. Um, it's just difficult to get a good merge from this because one of the things about XML is, uh, you know, it's, it's I don't know the right way to say this, but I'll just to me it's it's tier based. So, um, you know, here's my my DTS executables node, and then beneath it is a DTS executable. Well, there's nothing that says this executable, uh, this one called um, DFT blob load pattern, it, it doesn't have to be stored here. It could be stored beneath the next executable. And the XML is still valid, the package is still valid, but if you go to compare and or merge, now you've got you've got to have something that's aware that it's dealing with XML when it's going to merge. And and I just I the I only work with a handful of uh, source control engines. But uh, you know, TFS is one Microsoft Team Foundation server. Um, it doesn't manage that merge well at all. Uh, I've, I've worked with a couple of others, and I haven't found one yet that I feel really comfortable with saying that's the one you want to use to merge. Um, I think something needs to be almost SSIS aware, if that makes any sense, or at least yeah, yeah. XML aware. So would, would you, um, on a project, do you tend to kind of um, maybe use exclusive lockouts for things like a DTS package so you can only get one person change at a time kind of thing? I do. So part of the business practice is is I'll, I'll recommend that uh, when you write SSIS packages, you write very small unit of work packages. So you only need one person to make a change on that package at a time. And, you know, but this, of course, creates this other problem where if you've got a bunch of functionality, say you're loading all the dimensions, into a data warehouse. Um, maybe you're doing the extracts and the loads um, in one SSIS package. You, ha you have a couple dozen uh, data flows in there. Well, if you create that monolith, of course you've only got one package to maintain. That's the good news. The bad news is it's all of that functionality is in one package and therefore coupled. So, you know, if you break it into a couple of dozen SSIS packages, each with a data flow, uh, you, you've created another problem. You've solved that problem. But now you've got, uh, you remember when we were looking at the catalog, you uh, you cannot right-click on, on a uh, project and execute it. There's just no facility for that. So you have to have a way now to do that. And I do it with a metadata-driven framework. Um, I store metadata inside of the SSIS DB database. And I've got some simple versions of it out there. but what it allows me to do is string together a bunch of SSIS packages and say execute, you know, one, two, three, four, five um, in this order. And now that and that sounds like a great solution, and it, it is in most cases, but it creates another problem. This is just keeps going, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> now, now I have to manage that metadata, and so, you know, it's um, it's one of the things that I've been I've been playing with. I'll, I'll pop this up just to. Just to show you, um, and I'll just run this real quick, but um, you'll have to look at my ugly C sharp. I promise not to laugh. Um, but you know, now I've got a uh, yeah. So let me yeah, let me drop this down so we can see. So now I've got here's the catalog, and and I've got a collection of what I call um, applications. So there's one called the Framework Restartability Test, and it's comprised of these three SSIS packages. So what I'm able to do is store metadata and say, you know, run child one, then child two, then child three, and I can do things like uh, like uh, change the order and stuff. I won't click save because I know I've got a breakpoint in there, and it's going to uh, it, it would break there. But there's you know there's just no free lunch when it comes to this stuff, Michael, and I'm sure it's that way in all of the in, uh, integration stories that you hear. You know, you, you fix one thing, and you you know you may fix a, this piece of a problem, but you may also create this other thing. And what I'm 
what I'm striving to do um, at you know at Andy Lemon Consulting. That's my that's where I work. Uh, my boss is kind of a jerk sometimes, but what I'm <laughs> what I'm striving to do is, is is solve this problem. And I'm a you know I, I I'm a being a data person, a Microsoft data person. I'm familiar and a, and a fan actually of what Redgate's done with their database lifecycle management, and I want to uh, build out a bunch of tools and utilities that support data integration lifecycle management in SSIS. And I, I think there's a neat opportunity here because, um, again, they don't they didn't quite finish all of this like some of the other engines did, but that creates an opportunity for us to customize this however we like. And, and these frameworks are a, kind of a neat way to do that. And, you know, it's just, again, it's just one solution. It's not, not the only one. And there's uh, other folks have solved these problems in other ways. So it's, you know, when you, when you get to things like source control uh, and, um, you know, and managing, uh, you know, managing this in that DevOps environment, um, there's, there's just a lot to the story that, that Still needs to be written at this point, in, in my opinion. I think it's the old, it's the old secret, isn't it? Between, you know, you read, you read the book, but then you get the experience of doing it in the real world, and you, you know, kind of the things that work and the things, the things that you need to kind of come up with a way of solving the problems. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've got, uh, we've got another question from Seema. Um, so the first thing is Seema um, wanted to say that um, they really like this session and. and it's really good, so um, that's great that we've got some good feedback coming in. Um, Seema wanted to know a little bit more about your thoughts on deployment automation for SSIS, and if there's any tools that you've used or if you've got any recommended approaches. I, I have, and I've been, um, again, being a, a fan of Redgate, I've been watching what they're doing on the database side, and they're using Octopus Deploy, and I've seen um, I'm actually communicating with uh, with a client now about this. I am unfamiliar with Octopus. I'm learning it. It's actually installed on this virtual machine that, that I've been using to do the demos with. And uh, this particular client is deploying to the file system, although they're running 2012 or 2014, which supports catalog deployment. They're, ex they're uh, executing their uh, SSIS in the file system, which you can do. It's fully backwards compatible. Uh, from what I've seen in 2016, it's also backwards compatible. You can run SSIS in 2016 just like you ran packages in 2015 in the MSDB or the file system. And, and that's really good. Um, but I, I, I haven't finished that story yet, Seema. Um, I'd love to give you an answer. I, I promise you I'm working on it. It's, I, I would say it's active. I'm actively working on it. It's uh, when I hit a snag. In some of the development I'm doing with these tools you're seeing today, I um I'll go play with Octopus a little bit more. I've been playing with um with PowerShell because the um the 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 .NET libraries that I use to build the tools that I've showed you today, um those libraries are the same that I can access in uh, PowerShell, and they're all .NET objects, and and it you can. Uh, you can do the deployments uh, directly from those. I, I haven't done those a lot, obviously, but I've been playing around with that idea. Right now, the best I can do is is what I showed you and compare. When I, um, you know, when I can right click and generate the script, or I can go to the, the actual project and export the ISPAC file. Um, that's you know that's where I am now. If you export that, of course, you can, you know, you can then go into um, uh, you know, one of the, the documents library, for instance, and 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 it's there should be one in here somewhere. There's one uh, data flow. You know, and I can just I can do this as I using the integration services deployment wizard. Um, that I know that's not the uh, that's not the end of the story, and I know that's not what you're asking. Is there a way to automate this? There absolutely is, and there's some really interesting solutions out there for it. But what I'm trying to find. There's a way to put the story into uh, the, in, the the bigger picture, which I think is the database lifecycle management stuff. And in Microsoft's world, the um, the team that's talking about that uh, more than anyone, uh, in my opinion, is the uh, is the Redgate folks. And they have a pretty cool story with that. Um, 
So what I'd love to do is find a way to kind of hook into what they're doing. And they're using Octopus, and and they have some uh, database deploy tools. I, I really think those all need to be knit together, um, data integration deployment and, and database deployment. So do I have the answer uh, today? I don't. Um, but it is something that I'm actively working on. So I guess there's a couple of things there potentially, Andy. I mean, first one is um, we've got a session in about three weeks' time on Integration Monday where um, Bill Chestnut's going to be talking about Octopus Deploy for BizTalk. Oh. So you might you might you might find that quite interesting just to to get a bit more background on Octopus. But I, I guess um, if people feel that that whole sort of um, data lifecycle management in terms of automated deployment, if that's a topic that we're interested in, if people can, can let me know, then maybe I can reach out to Redgate and see if, um, you know, see if we can maybe get Andy and Redgate to have a chat about possible ideas for a future session. Maybe we can bring in some of their tooling and share some ideas about what, what might work in that area. That would be fantastic. I, I've seen um, both Steve Jones and Grant Frenchy talk about um, Talk about the, the the octopus deploy and their uh, their database deploy tools and, and and it's it's a pretty mature product. I, I got to see it last month at the uh, past summit in Seattle, and um, it's it's neat to see what they're doing. They're it's 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 high tech, cutting edge, and they're uh, again aiming at the DevOps enterprise for uh, for deploying database. I I want to find a solution that hooks into that and. Um, and does the same thing with SSIS because, uh, Seema, you probably know this already, it's it's not uncommon to update a database and then also have to update some data integration package, be it SSIS, data stage, or, or Informatica. So that we've also got um, Deepesh asking about um, Microsoft release management support for SSIS. So I, I, mean, I, I don't know about yourself, Andy, I'm not too familiar with that, but I guess that, that just could fit into that same space where we can go and do a little bit of investigation and see if we can find you know find a story to pull together about that as a, a future topic. So I think if, um, if if people are interested in that, just pop a little comment on the um, Q&A, and if, if we get enough people who, who are interested, we'll, we'll see if we can get that as a future topic next year sometime. Well, I'll, I'll say this, um, Michael, with, with if I'll ask you first, um, I'm I'm in beta on Catalog Compare, and I don't want to um, to be pushing products unless you you know without your permission. I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit, and if you say no, it's okay. Uh, so you let me know. I, I, to be honest, I think as long as it's within a story that um, that covers an, a, an interesting you know integration topic, and I mean it sounds like. Um, Deployment scenario, um, you know, we, it, it's a really popular topic in the biz talk space. So if um, you know, and, and I'm getting a lot of feedback as well that guys who are doing biz talk are doing a lot of SSIS anyway as part of those projects. Right. So I think I think SSIS deployments a pretty solid topic for um, for this group. So if you know if you've got stuff in that space and the, the tool and that you're working on fits with that, I'm sure people will be happy to learn more about it and. I think um, you know everybody's given me good feedback on tonight. Anyway, okay. Uh, you know, well, I'll just I'll just share this about that. If um, the the uh, the place you can go if you uh, if you want to know more about SSIS Compare, um, it's SSIS Catalog Compare, and it's that Bitly address there, um, bit.ly uh, slash SSIS Catalog Compare. If you'll go there, you can look around. Um, it's it's still in beta, but I am selling um, versions of it, and uh, there's details out there. You can also email me directly at, uh, at um, if you, if um, if you want to know more about you know what I'm doing with this, or if you have suggestions, uh, Andy Leonard Consulting dot com is a, is a way to reach out, reach out to me, and I'd be happy to um, to try and answer your questions. I absolutely love this kind of feedback, Michael, because it's, uh, it's two things. First, it's validating that the experiences that I've had that motivated me to build these tools in the first place are, are not unique. It's not just me. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's also cool to get the feedback that people are interested in this, that they're struggling with it. And I'll just, you know, just all cards on the table. Um, I've got a, a video out 
that uh, you can you can I'm happy to send you a link to called the three minute drill. If you've ever moved an SSIS project with an environment and parameters and references and mappings, if you've ever moved that from like a test to a UAT environment or a UAT to production, um, it takes you more than three minutes. <laughs> so I've, I call this video the three minute drill where I just go in to compare and I, I script everything out doing the generate all scripts part and I walk through, it's all real time on, on my uh, VM here and you know and I'm taking a little extra time as I, as I talk through it. So it's I, like like you said, I, I imagine there's similar needs in the uh, in the BizTalk space. Um, and if people are using SSIS in concert with BizTalk, uh, code promotion, uh, migration, e even code demotion, if you want to pull stuff out of the production instance because it's time to begin working on uh, version two, uh, it's it's even you know one of those things. There's nothing that says you can't right click. Uh, over here on the, uh, the UAT version and generate all the scripts there. It'll it'll build that version as well. So it's you know I I, I didn't build these tools to uh, to get rich. Obviously I did it to uh, help my clients and, and to help me manage uh, manage these problems. But if um, and you can tell looking at the prices of the of this, especially in the beta, that um that I'm not trying to get rich. But I'll I just want to help, and that's. That's why I'm talking to you to, to this evening, Michael, and um, why I really appreciate your uh, your time and patience, and the opportunity to speak to to your audience. Yeah, that's really great, Andy. Um, so could we um and put to equally put you back on the spot? Could we maybe get you to come back again sometime next year and um, talk talk to us some more about um, sort of the, the data integration space? I think uh, you know we, we've got um, speakers lined up till kind of you know, kind of early springtime, but maybe if we got you back sometime around April or May, if, if you're interested. I would love that, Michael. Thank you. Great. And, and also, if you've got any suggestions of other other people in, you know, in the data space who um, you think would be good to bring into the group as well, if, you know, if you've got any fellow, um, you know, fellow sort of SSIS type MVPs or, you know, good people in the community, um, feel free to introduce us to those people. I would, I'd be honored. There's a there's a it's a great community. There's a bunch of them out there. Good, good. So I think um, all the questions seem to have dried up now. Um, so I'll, I'll just kind of start closing the meeting down. But uh, firstly, thank you very much to Andy for coming on and um, you know talking to us about um, data lifecycle management. Um, thanks for everyone who who turned up tonight. And I'm I'm really quite pleased that with this being a topic that's an, an area a little bit different than what we've covered most weeks, and and we've had a pretty good turnout. So I think we have. Uh, we got up to about 42 at one point on the call, Andy, which is which is really good because I thought SSIS might be a little bit niche and take us a while to build up an interest sure. in that topic. So that's that's a really awesome start, I think. That's um, but, great. So next next week we um, we're going to be doing about data factory. So we've got Martin Abbott, um, who I, I have a feeling that Martin might be joining us really early in the morning because I think um, he's in uh, Perth, which. Uh, I guess could be about 4 a.m. or something crazy at about that time. So uh, hopefully Martin's not too tired when he joins us next week. But uh, otherwise, thank you everyone for turning up tonight, and uh, we'll catch you all next Monday night. And uh, have a great day over in the, in the states, Andy. And we'll I'll sort of drop you a couple of emails and and chat about some of those um, ideas. Thank you, Michael. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>